Well, a, a warm welcome um, to a session this afternoon on the new political capitalism uh, with our guest, Dr. Joe Zamet Lucia, uh, the founder of Radix. Uh, very much looking forward um, to the event, um, looking at how leadership needs to change uh, to take account of the, 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 the new reality of business. Um, my job as chair today um, is to make the introductions, obviously, which I'll keep very short and sweet so I can get out of the way uh, so we can listen to Joe's presentation. Uh, secondly, to thank our sponsors who um, allow us at the FS Club to range uh, widely over a, a, a whole series of subjects, science, technology, innovation, finance. Uh, we are really very grateful to them for their continuing support. Um, and the agenda today is very very clear. Um, I introduce and then move out of the way. Um, we move over to Joe for his keynote presentation and then we'll have about 20 minutes of uh, available for question and answers um, towards the end of the session. Uh, for those of you who haven't used the GoToWebinar platform before, um, you'll see on the dashboard on the screen uh, a question box. Uh, this is where you can type in questions, um, which then I will pick up and be able to uh, moderate uh, during the Q&A session. So please do, um, at any point during the presentation, uh, feed your questions for Joe uh, into, into the question box on your screen. Uh, just to say, we will be um, sending uh, details of questions that are asked during the session to Joe, along with your contact details. Um, so um, that, that will help you if there needs to be continuing conversations uh, after the event. Um, the, uh, today's event is being recorded, um, and so, uh, if you uh, miss some of the, um, the golden words that we're going to hear from Joe, um, or you have colleagues who you think will be interested in the presentation, um, it will be available maybe within 24, 48 hours after the event on the uh, on the FS Club website. So um, it's available for you to go back. And of course, recordings of many of our other webinars um, are available, um, both as videos and indeed uh, as podcasts on uh, or wherever you normally receive uh, your podcasts. Um, that's all by way of introduction. Um, I'm really looking forward to the session and to hearing more um, from Joe um, about his book and his thoughts. Um, and Joe, over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to put up a few slides that I'll talk to, um, and then we can have a discussion afterwards. So. I'll show the window. You let me know, Mike, if that's visible. I'm assuming that's it is. Fine, anyway. yep. Great, thank you. So, <clears throat> um, I I don't think I need to to say to anybody on this webinar or or, or anywhere else really that the world is changing um, and changing quite fast. And um, what I'm going to suggest throughout this, uh, this, this presentation is that we're moving into uh, an era that I call political capitalism. And the question is, how does business remain successful, uh, or some businesses at least, remain successful as the world around us changes? And, you know, as Charles Darwin has said, um, you know, those who are successful uh, in an evolutionary process are not those who are the strongest um, or the ones that are the most clever, but the ones that are most able to adapt to change. So the question is, how does, how does one adapt to change and what is the nature of that change, at least as I see it? So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to cover three, three issues. One is the broad socio-cultural context. The second is, in this new context, what is the role of business? And finally, what does it mean for corporate leadership? So those are the three things that I will, that I will focus on. So I'll start with a bold statement, which is that capitalism, and we can have a discussion for several hours as to how we each want to define capitalism, but we won't, uh, <clears throat> has been really the only resilient approach to organizing political economies. Other approaches have been tried and have failed. And the reason capitalism has been successful is because the nature of capitalism has never been the same. It's changed uh, over, over time. 
So, you know, we've had a feudal form of capitalism, although we can argue whether that was true capitalism, given as given that there wasn't really a market for labor. But anyway, we've moved to mercantile capitalism, industrial capitalism, consumer capitalism. And the era that we're in at the moment, which I argue is ending, um, which I call financialized capitalism. Um, and by financialized capitalism, I mean two things. One is that anything that does that doesn't have that that we can't put a dollar sign to uh, has we treat as having no value. So everything has been, you know, everything we try to convert everything into a dollar value, even the things that we know can't be converted into that. And the second aspect of financialized capitalism is that an increasing proportion of economic activity happens through financial channels rather than through industrial channels. Uh, and that's the era that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, and my contention is that that is coming to an end and that the 21st century is the age that, 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 that at least start, started already, but as it, it will evolve, is the age of what I call political capitalism. Now, why this change and why do I call it political capitalism? Well, first of all, if we're going to talk about anything political, we have to have a shared understanding of what we might mean by politics. And whenever you mention politics to business people or to many people in the street, um, everybody groans and, and, and associates the word politics with the not so edifying electoral process, with petty party politics, um, and you know all that sort of stuff that we don't like about politics. But that's not really what politics is. That is part of the political process, but it's not what politics is. So politics is the mechanism by which we make collective decisions about the sort of society we want to live in. Uh, that's, it, it is the only mechanism we have by which we can you know, collectively, uh, in some way, uh, decide what sort of, you know, how we want to live and what sort of society we want around us. And politics is essentially a battle of ideas. Um, which way, which way, what sort of society do we want to live in and how do we get there? And that has, that has been, you know, a battle of political ideas over the centuries and will continue forever. And in politics, participants try to control the narrative and they do it by tapping very deep-rooted values and beliefs. So they don't do it by invoking, although some, there is some, of course, self-interest, but, but the, the, the tapping, the emotional tapping of deep-rooted values and beliefs is a much more important part of politics. And we've seen this in, um, in you know, recent times uh, straight in our faces. During the, the Brexit referendum, for instance, the Remain campaign tried to tap into objective self-interest. It was all about the numbers. It was all about that it's going to cost you money. It was all about, you know, the economics of it all. Whereas the Leave campaign tapped very much deeper uh, a sense of values, beliefs, patriotism, you know, take back control, um, you know, we want to govern ourselves, all these rather more fuzzy things uh, rather than the kind of numbers driven objective self-interest. And in, in, in the political sphere, um, if it comes to a battle between reason and emotion, emotion always wins. So that kind of distinguishes, um, if you like, the business way of thinking, which we like to think or like to convince ourselves is rational and numbers driven, um, and the political process, which is much less so. And, you know, we have many players that that play in this political economy, um, you know, private enterprise, civil society, government citizens. And I want to focus on this phrase political economy, which is something that has kind of almost disappeared from our everyday, uh, everyday conversation. We talk about the economy, we talk about economics and 
we've made ourselves believe that this is all a science and it's all about the numbers and that we can calculate it all and that can, can all be mathematical. Um, and we've forgotten that economics has always been a branch of politics, that there is no economic decision that doesn't have a political implication. And the phrase political economy has fallen out of fashion, uh, but it's coming back. And you know everything we do in the economy, uh, including the activities of business, are highly political acts. And I want to make some some other bold statements. First, that there is really no such thing as the free market. We all talk about the free market, but nothing like the free market exists because markets can only operate within a set of rules. Um, just like if you ask people to go and play a football game, they know what you mean only because they know the rules of football. If you take 22 people onto a field and say, it's a free market, play a game, they don't know what to do. Um, they can't play the game. So markets only operate because, and can only operate, because there is a set, there are a, there is a set of rules within which they operate. And those rules are set by governments. So markets themselves, both local and global, are primarily political constructs, not commercial or economic constructs, because it is governments and the political system that set the rules of, of both of local markets and of global markets. And given that, businesses are there for political and social actors. They're playing in that space, which is intensely political. And we've got into this mindset that the role of business is to create shareholder value. And I put create their creators in brackets because business only creates some of the shareholder value. Um, quite a chunk of value that is funneled to shareholders is not actually created. It is taken out of, for instance, environmental capital. It's taken out of social capital. You know, when people close down factories, fire, fire a lot of people, decimate communities, you're actually consuming social capital um, and funneling that into shareholder value, into shareholder value. So, so not all shareholder value is created. Some of it is taken from elsewhere and funneled to shareholders. And that's a process that's been put on steroids during the era of financialized capitalism. Um, so, so businesses, I argue, are political and social actors, and they have a very important political role to play. They employ people, they determine wages. They have a political role because they are actors in the sort of society we want to live in. So they cannot shrug off their political role. So why um, are we moving to an era of political capitalism? Well, what we're finding is that the externalities of financialized markets now have become so visible and so large that they can no longer be ignored. We know that the inequalities uh, in society have, have come to bear very directly on the structure of markets. You know, governments have to uh, uh, feel they have to intervene a lot more in the structures of markets because of the issues and divisions and so, uh, that we have in our societies. And as a, as a result, businesses themselves need to become increasingly reflexive about their own political roles. You know, all these conditions are well in place today. You know, we've seen rising inequality, climate change, environmental degradation. You know, there's a big backlash against the idea of globalization, which was seen as un an unalloyed good in the 80s and 90s. Um, we have increasing political and geopolitical divisions, uh, which has made the, the which has increased uh, the questions around what we should mean by globalization. You know, I mean, you know, we're all living through. The, the Ukraine issues and the geopolitical divisions that are driving those and their impact on trade, their impact on oil prices and, and all this sort of thing. 
we have increased political activism within companies um, and the citizens, the, custom, the customers of businesses no longer just think of themselves as, as consumers. And consumers, I think, is a terrible term in that it suggests that the only value of a human being it depends on how much they can consume. But they're increasingly making purchasing decisions um, and choosing who to do business with thinking like citizens not just as customers so you know what do, you know what is the implication of me doing business with you um if you're putting out all these emissions and i don't want you to do that so so that there's there's a politicization of the the, the market in terms of the customer uh, who thinks of themselves as citizens so you know the general feeling is that something out there is no longer working uh, it's, it's, it's no longer working as we would like it to. And of course, that's what drives change. And change is driven by political action. So as, as Lord Haig said, you know, people of my generation have lived through a, a bit of a golden age where the window of debate between, within political ideas was actually very narrow. Um, I mean, you know, go back to the 80s and 90s and you take Thatcher and Tony Blair. Tony Blair's pol politics, you know, just to be a, a little bit provocative, was essentially continuity Thatcher, but with a bigger smile. Um, it was, you know, th there was no big shift in, in the political framework within which one was operating. So uh, people of my generation have lived through a period where we've seen no major global conflicts, where we had come to the conclusion that, you know, there was no longer a struggle for political ideas. Essentially, Western democratic market-based ideas had won. It was the end of history. Um, so we could focus all our energies on the economic and the commercial and the political took, took a, bad, a back seat. But now this has changed very dramatically. The global struggle for political ideas is back. We have, who would have thought 50 years ago, 30 years ago, that the second biggest economy in the world would be an authoritarian regime where there is essentially very little separation between the private and the public sector? Who would have thought that that political um, structure would end up being the second biggest economy in the world um, and and you know even within the west uh, the, the the window of political ideas making an impact is has broadened uh, we've got resurgent nationalism um, we've got you know issues with immigration and all these sorts of stuff so so the, the struggle is is back and once there is a bigger struggle for political ideas, then the economic and the commercial will have to tend to take more of a backseat. Uh, the political will take priority. And as a result of that, corporations now find themselves un under influence from many, many sides. You know, we used to think of, you know, okay, companies respond to their investors. Uh, to their shareholders. Well, now they have to respond to a hell of a lot more people than just their shareholders. Um, in an age of social media, in an age of increased transparency, in an age of daily whistleblowing, in an age of uh, much more um, uh, robust government action, in an age where civil society organizations are ever present, ever more investigative, exerting ever more pressure, um, the idea that the role of the corporation or the only the, the, the main the main group that a corporation has to answer to are investors and financiers, you know, that's for the birds. Uh, sure, they have to answer to their investors, they always will, but now they have to answer to a hell of a lot more people. So it's a very different world that corporations need to operate within. And I'll just take some examples. Um, I'll just take these three examples as, as an uh, So Google, um, Google had to abandon 
10 million 10 billion worth of contracts over a 10 year period with the with the US Department of Defense because its employees objected they said we shouldn't be using our AI technology for defense purposes now you can agree with that position or you can disagree with that position I'm not here to make a judgment all I'm saying is that an employee revolt essentially put paid to 10 billion worlds of contract and an employee revolt based on the political views of those employees. Similarly with Microsoft, it had an employee uprising uh, because Microsoft was going to sell its technology uh, for border control in the United States. And its employees said, you know, our immigration policy is unacceptable. We shouldn't be doing business with border control authorities because we don't approve of their uh, immigration policy. And uh, Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, sent, sent out a memo um, which started with this. Uh, and this is an explicitly political position. You know, 20 years ago, the idea that a CEO of a major corporation would send out something so explicitly political was, you know, inconceivable. Um, we all know about HSBC, um, a British bank operating primarily in China, uh, <clears throat> that's come under a lot of pressure uh, for, its, for its collaboration with the Chinese authorities, for its stance on China. And when it was asked, when, when the CEO was asked by the House of Commons uh, committee why his head of China signed up publicly to the Chinese government's declaration that removed a lot of rights from Hong Kong citizens, he responded remarkably by saying that was not a political act. Um, the reality is it's not that simple. You know, a, a, a company like HSBC cannot stay out of geopolitics. It's no longer possible. Um, so, you know, as it says there, you know, the job somebody said, I can't remember where this quote came from, um, <clears throat> you know, the chairman's job now is 80% politics and 20% business. So corporations are embroiled in these very explicitly political issues and more, not just these, but, but you know, down to down to the, the down to how people look at brands um, and and this is a relatively new development but my contention is that it is set to increase dramatically and you know what are people thinking they're saying when when questioned that ethical drivers when they evaluate companies they feel that ethical drivers and you know you can we can debate what the word ethical might mean, um, <clears throat> are much more important to them when doing business with a company or buying its products or whatever than uh, whether that company is competent or not. In between these two periods, uh, in Australia, this was a study by Carney, there's, there has been a fourfold increase in the number of involuntary exits by CEOs for essentially non-financial issues. 37% of all exits were for non-financial issues. A PwC study showed that in 2018, non-financial reasons why CEOs were dismissed exceeded financial reasons for the first time. So if you wanted sort of evidence that we're moving from an age of financialized capitalism to an age of political capitalism, you know, we can see it here before our eyes. And, you know, brands handle, that. It, I mentioned that it comes down to brands, and brands are starting to have a political meaning too. And they handle their meanings in very different ways, you know, all the way from the banal down to the core. And, you know, M&M uh, decided you know, their, their approach to politics was to say that their little characters were going to become more inclusive. Well, you know, we'll see. Nike jumped onto the Black Lives Matter um, uh, issue and made it, you know, an integral part of their, um, 
an integral part of their campaign. And people questioned, they said, you know, do you really mean it or is this opportunistic? Um, a company like Patagonia, if you go to the Patagonia website, they don't say we're in business to make money. They don't say we're in business to give money to our shareholders. They say they don't even say we're in business to sell clothing. They say we're in business to save our home planet. And Patagonia is a company that where environmental activism is embedded in their DNA because that's why they were founded. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you get, and not the other end, at the, at the next level, you get a company like Benetton that used to, that runs, uh, used to run, and now after a break has come back to running, these explicitly political campaigns. So this particular campaign was a campaign against the death sentence. And none of these campaigns featured any products, just, just it said, just the brand. Um, and they created a brand image purely based on challenging political issues. They never even promoted what they sold, but their customers felt empowered because they had a brand image that was sort of very edgy and, uh, and, and fighting for social justice as they saw it. So even at the brand level, the political issues are, are not just at the corporate level, but at the, at the product brand level, uh, we're seeing an increasing, an increasing amount of political activity. The net result of this is that we've really moved on from what used to be the Washington Consensus, where you know globalization was widely accepted as an unalloyed good, where we had a neoliberal political philosophy that government should keep out of everything and let the market do its thing. We've moved on from there. And you know, it was very explicit if you read the G7. Uh, Cornwall uh, declaration that we've moved to to a, to a, a time where there's a feeling because because things are not seen to be working as as we would like them to that government that politics and governments should move more proactively not necessarily to participate in 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 markets but to deliver a better p political economy by constructing markets and, 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 and influencing the shape of markets in different ways. Um, and again, this would have been inconceivable in the 80s and 90s. Which all raises the question of, you know, in this new environment, how should businesses think about what they're for? You know, what is business there for? You know, the 1970s, um, Milton Friedman famous article in the New York Times took the view business is only there for one thing which is to create shareholder wealth where those days it was always a bit of an aberration but but those days are now well and truly over um, and more people are seeing are, are believing and wanting business to be a much more active player in creating a better society now we will all have our own particular views on what constitutes a better society. Um, and that is, of course, the subject of political debate. Um, and eventually we make those choices by who we elect. Um, but the danger, I think, in all of this is how in how it's interpreted. So there's a danger that corporations see these pressures coming upon them. These pressures are really quite difficult to cope with because things are being thrown at companies from all sorts of different directions. But the, the, way, they react, the, the, the way they react to them is essentially business as usual. Let's focus on growth margins and quarterly earnings. And then we'll tick some boxes uh, so that we can put a pretty ESG hat on business as usual. And you know, some people will react like that. But some people will realize that that's not going to be sufficient, that this is actually fundamental and core to um, what they do on a day to day basis. And I remember many years ago, I was sitting in a meeting uh, with commercial and R&D people in a large multinational pharmaceutical company, and the R&D people were presenting their ideas. And at one point, one of the commercial people got bored 
and said, well, these ideas are all very well and scientifically very interesting, but you guys seem to have forgotten that we're here to make money. And the president of R&D turns to him and says, laddie, we're not here to make money. We're here to make medicines that make people better. And if we can do that well, then we'll make money. And that kind of common sense that making a profit and delivering returns is a consequence of actually adding value to your customers and to society, not the objective of business, that, that has been lost in an age of financialized capitalism. So what does it mean? Well, this is how <clears throat> leaders of businesses have tended to be forced almost to look at the world uh, in an age of financialized capitalism. So you look at the world from the inside out. You're inside your corporation and you think, how can I deliver my financial results? And how can I make sure that I deliver good stock price performance? And then you think, okay, what sort of organization do I need in order to deliver that. And then you say, and how does my organization, how can I make my organization work given you know, the culture that our society lives in at the moment and given the political environment that I, so it's, it's looking from the inside out. The financial performance becomes the first thing and then you structure around it. Um, <clears throat> in an age of political capitalism, we need to learn to look from the outside in to look at our organizations as other people see them, not as we see them from inside the corporation. So you have to start by saying, you know, what is the culture out there and what is the political environment in which I'm operating? Now, how do I create an organization that can add value to that, that is really valued by my society, really valued by our culture, that can build political capital for that organization? And then how do I make sure that having done that and having delivered that value, I can do it in a way that gives me the financial performance that I need. And, and if you look at it from the inside, from the outside in like this, rather than from the, from the inside out, you end up in very different places. And I would suggest places that are much, much more likely to be successful in an age of political capitalism that we are entering. So this is um, a matrix from my friend Sam Zadek, um, where you know we have issues uh, and we have how companies respond. So some issues are kind of latent. So you know things like inequality was latent for a while, and people just said, well, that's just how things are. Life's not fair. Um, then we move into you know, well, business has to do something about it, has to fix it. And then businesses that are maybe a little bit ahead of the game uh, find themselves maybe at a disadvantage and they, they can't fix it on their own. So then we move uh, to, to, from an age of maturity to an age when those things have to become institutionalized. Uh, they have, we have to have some kind of regulatory solution to create a level playing field. Um, and how businesses respond is on the vertical axis here where the first point of course is denial where that's not my job it's not my job to fix inequality it's not my job to fix environmental damage um, and then we move to the next thing where it's just okay well i'll do it uh, but i'm just in a compliance mode uh, so i'll i'll do less harm so if i'm in the fast fashion business i'll keep selling lots of things and and make sure they get thrown away so i can sell something else the next time but I'll reduce the amount of chemicals I use by 5%. And that's kind of the superficial compliance mode. <clears throat> Some companies will see the way the world is moving uh, and will say, right, well, the world is moving in this direction. I can actually exploit those opportunities to create first mover advantage so that as this world evolves, I'm going to be much more highly competitive than, than anybody else who's a laggard. And finally, we move into an, an era of collaboration um, where public policy tries to encourage the first movers rather than the laggards. Um, and 
you know, some companies will say, okay, well, we'll move along that line, but we'll go down this boundary because we don't want to be too risk to be too early and go, get caught in our pants down. We don't want to be left behind. Others will be in this zone where they feel that they can be ahead of the game and they can use the evolving environment to their advantage. Uh, others, of course, will, will fall behind uh, because business is not monolithic and that's the beauty of it. So just to conclude, I said that we'd, we'd cover the three, these three items. Um, well, I argue that we've entered a new era, which I call political capitalism, that in a new political capitalism, businesses have to start to be much more reflexive about their political role in our society, that they actually have, that, that business is much more important to our society than delivering quarterly results. It has a much bigger impact than that. Um, it's a much more important social political actor. And what does it mean for corporate leadership? Well, there's no such thing as uniform corporate leadership. So different companies will respond in different ways. Some will be ahead of the game, maybe too far ahead of the game, making it difficult for themselves. Some will be well ahead of others, creating significant and lasting advantages. Others will fall behind, and that's the nature of business. Um, I'll stop here. Oh, back over to you, Mike. Well, Joe, thank you very much for that uh, fascinating run through uh, the ideas um, of you know, the shift um, of you know, the, the way that businesses operate in a, in a very much in a changing world. And we've all seen examples of um, businesses with whom we you know, are customers or have relationships um, who have shifted their position into a very much a social position over time. Um, and whether they're ahead of the curve in the opportunity zone um, or whether they end up in the risk zone, um, it's in some cases, uh, depends on their success in uh, taking that social position. Um, so we move on to, to questions. Um, I've got a, it's, it's a, it's a few interesting points for you. I'm going to start with a question from Bob McDowell, who's in the Channel Islands, um, asking if we're in an age of political capitalism. Um, surely the ability of enterprise to lobby for their objectives shouldn't be restricted. Uh, in, in other words, you know, the, the, the question about um, how, how we regulate what businesses are enabled to do um, mm -hmm. in an age of political capitalism and when, whether you have any thoughts about that. Yes, so, so the word lobbying is um, has many layers of meaning. Um, so, <clears throat> so, so I, I would like to try and and maybe pass uh, the word lobbying is it's it's kind of by some people considered a dirty word it's it's it's, it's associated with bribery and corruption uh, etc but 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 uh, let's let's kind of pass the word lobbying and 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 just call it you know have conversations with governments um, and that is of course essential that corporations and businesses uh, have conversations with government. The question is, what is the purpose of that conversation? So if the purpose is to try and create narrow self-interest for one's own company at the expense of others, at the expense of other companies, or at the expense even of how markets function, um, or the, at the expense of citizens and the expense of society, then I don't think that's a particularly edifying process. Um, if, on the other hand, um, businesses are and should be having conversations about, you know, we all need to tackle climate change, let's have a conversation about collectively what's the best way of doing that. Uh, because if government starts to do certain things, they might have effects that, you know, unintended consequences and, and whatever. So collectively, let's work through what's the best way to get to point, from point A to pay, point B. Those sorts of conversations in an age of political capitalism, in my view, have to increase and increase much more dramatically uh, than, than they have been in the past. And I'll give you one example. Um, we're, we're about to be hit 
by the metaverse you know whatever that whatever that will end up looking like okay who is going to police who's going to maintain law and order in the metaverse <laughs> Um, what's, what's, what are the rules of that game going to be like? Those are conversations between governments and those companies that should be starting today, as opposed to what we've had in the past, where the companies rush ahead of time, um, create good things, but also a lot of chaos, which then becomes unregulatable and unaccountable. We can't have that sort of thing anymore. So yes, conversations, call them lobbying if you like, conversations, but conversations for a shared purpose, not for narrow self-interest or for things that are damaging to others or to our societies. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Donald McRae has asked uh, whether you think there was a robust measure of stakeholder, stakeholder value as opposed to shareholder value. Shareholder value has always been very easy to put a, a financial figure to, but how do we measure stakeholder value? Well, let me ask, start by asking a question back. How do you measure the love for your children? Uh, we can't measure it, but that doesn't make it unimportant. Um, you know, we've all got used to saying, you know, we can't do what we can't measure, and we attribute that to whatever his name is, Denning. That's not actually what Denning said. He didn't say anything of the sort. <laughs> um, he, he acknowledged that a lot of the most important things in life cannot be measured. Um, so I think that this over obsession, in my view, with measurement. Uh, has led us down some pretty poor paths uh, because we do that which we can measure and we believe we can measure everything. I think in this new era, management is going to get, have to get used to a world where things are, not everything is measurable and they have to make human judgments about whether things feel right or whether they don't feel right, whether they're being done with the right intentions uh, or whether they're not being done with the right intentions. Um, and of course, they can try to measure as much as possible as long as they don't take it too seriously. Um, you know, as long as you say, well, you know, this might give us, this might give us some indication of whether things are working or not, um, but it's not the answer. And we need to get away from the idea that unless things can be put on a spreadsheet, they don't matter. Um, you know, nobody runs their own personal life like that. Uh, so why should we run businesses like that? Um, so I think this is very uncomfortable uh, because we're getting to an, uh, an age, I think, where senior management is going to have to make some, you know, judgments on things that are very fuzzy, uh, very unmeasurable, very much emotional, um, very much cultural, um, very, very difficult things, difficult only in the sense that we're not used to making these judgments. And I th it, it, interesting, I used to, I, for people may not know, but I used to work in the civil service and work with um, politicians. Um, and one of the politicians I worked with gave the definition of what being a uh, minister of the state, minister of state was, he says, we're there to take the hard decisions when there's no clear answer. Exactly. Um, and that is actually as a politician's role. And what we're saying is that for business now, um, some aspects of that are being brought into the leadership of, of business as well. That's, that's a lovely quote. And, um, and I think, you know, businesses and business leaders getting used to the idea that there are no clear answers to many things mm -hmm. and they just have to make a judgment, the best personal judgment they can. That's a change, and, and yeah. it's not easy. Now, we've got a few more questions. We're running out of time, so I think we're going to have to go to sort of quick-fire comments on uh, yes. a few more questions. Uh, Hugh Purse has asked you know, whether you think it's a given that uh, the development of countries passes through that linear progression um, of different types of capitalism 
or is it possible to leapfrog and move straight into kind of um, you know, straight into a political capitalism, you know, jumping over uh, uh, other forms? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, if you want a quick fire answer, the real the real quick fire answer is I have no idea. <laughs> um, the only thing I tried to 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 uh, to lay out was more of a historical rather than a judgmental perspective to say this is where we've been and this is where we've been through. But it's an interesting question, and I have to think about it. Well, as, uh, as I said at the beginning, we'll be passing on email email contacts to people who ask questions. And so, if you do have thoughts and want to follow up with you, uh, there is there is that opportunity. So. Um, Kenneth Rooms has asked, um, how do we square the fundamental extremes of uh, political psychology and morality um, you know, if, if we don't have a journey that everything is a Wittgenstein philosophy? Um, you know, so, so how do we square that, the extremes um, of psychology and morality? It's a big question for the end of a well, webinar. It's, 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 a, it's a big question, but I think, I think a quick fire answer to, to a question that doesn't deserve a quick fire answer <laughs> is that one of the characteristics of politics is that you will never get agreement. You know, the, the nature of politics is the con constant contestation of ideas. Um, and, and that is what makes it dynamic, and that is what allows progress, because we don't know what progress is. We just contest what progress might look like. The only time in politics where you don't have dissent, where you don't have debate of ideas, is when you have authoritarianism. Um, but you know, it's the nature, it's the, one of the good things that we have constant contestation of ideas. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to press on and we're going to keep you a little bit over time, I'm afraid, because we've got uh, right. quite a few questions still to get through. Um, Eric yeah, Br Br Bruven has asked, um, in the age of political capitalism, is the Lockean state of nature type of individual existence possible? Um, you know, with Peter Thiel arguing that democratic politics is becoming about people collectively hating each other. Um, you know, do you agree with that? And if yes, does political capitalism offer a different choice? Uh, you know, but somewhere between haste and other, any other emotion that we, we care to mention. <laughs> well, again, I think I come back to the previous question. Um, the, the nature of political capitalism is political. So, so there will always be different views. Um, I think the question is how those different views are expressed and whether we learn to respect other people's views even when we disagree with them and you know part of the thing i think that makes democracy function and it's something that that we've sort of forgotten is that in a democracy one has to accept that sometimes one's own ideas don't win out you know sometimes your ideas lose they don't have enough popular support. Um, the question is, how do we react to that? Do we react to that with fury? Um, or do we react to that by saying, well, you know, people don't agree with me. And, you know, it doesn't mean necessarily mean I'm wrong, but maybe I have to be more persuasive. Hmm. So, so I think that we've, we have entered an era. I think the, the, the person who asked the question is quite right. We have entered an era you know, with social media, etc., where kind of civil disagreement has become very difficult. Um, and I think we have to re-find that in some way. Thank you. Um, we've still got a few more. Um, Tom sure. Abeles is interested in the, um, you know, the inside out, uh, looking at uh, the process or the outside in. And just asking, you know, if you're raising money, raising capital for business, you know, does the investment community yet also have to um, turn itself around to look rather than at return on investment to be looking um, outside in um, on social purpose and, uh, and other goals? Well, you know, the investment community is not immune uh, or shielded from the developments of the world. <laughs> um, you know, they live in the same world. Uh, I think what the investment community uh, in my view, the, how the investment community needs to start looking at their investments 
is not by saying by uh, by having as their first question what's the return I'm, I'm going to make on this investment the first question should be why are you adding value you know why does the world need you in what way are you making people's lives better and then the second question should be and can you do that in a way that gives me a good return so it's not forgetting the idea of return it's that that's not the purpose that's a consequence of what you do and what you do well it's not the purpose um and we've got the last comment and question from bob mcdowell his comment is that um that your presentation makes an excellent case for enterprise that remaining private, small, and fragmented in order to manage at least some elements of political exposure. Um, I think maybe slightly tongue in cheek. Um, <laughs> but the question is, says that many would judge that the quality of politicians has diminished over time and that politicians like CEOs are more transient. Um, do you think that provides a good base or is that a problem for political capitalism? Well, I, I find the question of the quality, I, I've had a recent debate with someone about this, about this issue of the quality of politicians. And I kind of find it difficult to know what a good politician is um, and what type of politician. I think it's different if you're the president of the United States um, versus if you're a backbencher in a small country. They're both politicians, but they require different skills um, uh, because their job is actually quite fundamentally different. To a large extent, the politicians we get are shaped by the culture we have. Um, so to, uh, to some extent, we, there are two things. One is, do we make life for politicians these days so unattractive, so impossible, that it's actually very difficult for anybody to want to do it. The second thing is I think there's maybe a bit of a danger for those of us who come from a business background to define a good politician in the way we define a good businessman. You know, somebody who can deliver operations, deliver the numbers, deliver on his policies, et cetera, et cetera. But politics is a very different thing. Um, so I, I have I, I struggle with the idea of with, with trying to understand how even to start thinking about the quality of politicians. <laughs> As I said, I used to be a civil servant. I do have views on what makes a good politician, what doesn't. Um, but I shan't, I shan't share them here. We've um, from, we've... from a civil from a civil servant's perspective, <laughs> which may not be everybody's perspective. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> Um, we, we've run over time. Um, thank you to you, Joe, for allowing that and um, audience, uh, many of you who managed to stay with us. Um, that was a fascinating uh, presentation and session. Um, and I'd just like to have, um, offer a few, a few thanks. Um, first of all, again, to our sponsors for allowing uh, us to host such interesting uh, discussions. And you'll see that um, we've got uh, other discussions indeed tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Um, a, a chat on realizing the renewable jet en energy internet and trying to mend the financial interconnectors. So if you're interested in thinking about how you finance you know, a really um, almost global energy network, uh, come along tomorrow morning. And the discount process is the problem um, on the 1st of March, um, a really important point for understanding sustainability. Um, th 3rd of March, cybersecurity, how to keep yourself safe online and what tips the balance between larger us and them and us. Um, so some fascinating subjects coming up and please do uh, come along to those and keep an eye on the website to see um, what else is up and coming. Um, and finally, just um, to offer my thanks to the audience. Um, it's been wonderful to see you and to have that engagement during the question and answer session. Uh, and finally, to offer um, you know, your thanks and my thanks uh, to Joe Zamet Lucia, um, who as well as giving a fascinating presentation has uh, provided for the really engaging discussion. Uh, and normally, Joe, I'd be able to throw open the great hall in which you're speaking um, for a round of applause. I'm afraid that's not quite as possible on the GoToWebinar platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll have to make do with a very small round of applause. Thank um, you. And my thank thanks you. to you once again. Um, I hope we'll see you again um, uh, as our discussions evolve. Uh, and don't forget, to buy, don't forget to buy the book, everybody. <laughs> Don't forget to buy the book. The link was in is in the chat, um, or it'll be on the website uh, after the event. 
Thank you very much.